Hey there folks, Caroline Mitchell here. I'm an ex-police detective and crime thriller author and today I'm bringing you the unsolved case of Thomas Brown. This case is super fishy. In fact, it really got under my skin. Stick around and I'll tell you why. Okay, it's November 2016 and we're going to a place called Canadian in Texas. It's a pretty place surrounded by miles of prairie land and called Canadian after the river that runs north of the town. It's a panhandled community, which is a name given for a part of a land which is narrow and sticks out from a larger area, like the handle of a pan. Canadian is a small, prosperous city with about 3,000 inhabitants. It's a place where everyone knows their neighbours and their business, and it's sometimes said to be a little bit clicky. Thomas Brown lived here with his mother, Penny, who was a local elementary school teacher. His stepfather, Chris, worked for an oil field supply company and his brother, Tucker, was staying over for Thanksgiving at the time. Thomas was 18, six feet one, and weighed about 180 pounds. He attended Canadian high school and was said to have been a really nice lad. I mean, hugely popular with his fellow students and team players on his football team. He was a class president and excelled in drama and football and he had a great quirky sense of humour and gave his time freely to anyone who needed it. His friend Caleb would later say that he couldn't think of a single person who didn't like him. On Wednesday, November the 23rd in 2016, at around six o'clock in the evening, Thomas told his mum that he was going to meet up with his friends, as he'd recently broken up with his girlfriend, Sage. And although the breakup had been amicable, they stayed friends, and Penny was happy for Thomas to go out and enjoy himself. So she gave him her credit card so he could put some fuel in his red Dodge Durango. There was nothing out of ordinary about that evening, and Thomas seemed happy enough. He drove to the Canadian Middle School parking lot, which is where he met high school friends Caleb King and Michael Castletime. Caleb and Michael rode in Thomas's truck as Thomas drove around in a series of streets that his friends called Tom's Loop. Michael later said that it was a typical night and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. The boys chatted, listened to music and stopped off at Alexander's for a quick dinner. At 8 p.m. they returned to the middle school parking lot to meet Christian Webb and Michael said goodnight and went home in his car. Tom and Caleb got into Christian's silver Dodge Charger and Christian was home for Thanksgiving weekend so it was the first time she'd seen Thomas in a while. She later said that he seemed really happy that night and at one point they visited the Canadian Wagon Bridge and went for a walk. So at 11 o'clock that night the group got into their own cars and drove home. And at 28 minutes past 11, Thomas was seen on CCTV pulling up at Franck Oil in Canadian. Bank records would confirm that he swiped his mum's card there at 28 minutes past 11. And there was just fuel pumps there. There wasn't any attendance. There was no shops. There was no one around. Thomas's mother, Penny, began to get worried when Thomas didn't come home. According to his mum, Thomas never missed a curfew. In fact, he was usually home well before curfew so he could go online and play some games with his friends. She texted him a couple of times, but they weren't read. And she tried again, but then the message said it wasn't delivered, uh, which usually means the phone is switched off. And by now she was really worried. Any parents watching knows about this horrible feeling in the pit of your stomach when you can't get in touch with your child. And when I say child, they could be between eight or 18 years of age. It doesn't matter what age they are. So they drove around the area in search of Thomas, just presuming maybe he'd a flat tire or he'd broken down. And at two o'clock in the morning, Penny called her son's friends, Caleb and Christian, but they said they hadn't seen him either. Now this was a small community, so word soon began to spread. And Penny later said she didn't call 911 straight away because her husband was a volunteer fireman and he gave them the number for dispatch. It took about 45 minutes for the deputy to respond and she said he went out to look for Thomas. Now I know this seems like a crazy amount of time to wait uh, for some people but this doesn't set my alarm bells ringing straight away because at the time you have to remember the police didn't know there was foul play. By half three in the morning, Pine Gregory, a deputy from the Hemphill County Sheriff's Department, arrived at Penny's home. And Tucker went with him in a police car to search for Thomas during what must have been the longest night in Penny's life. 
while we were driving around, Tucker noticed a usually locked gate which was left unlocked and he pointed this out to Pine Gregory and it's been said that Pine said he wouldn't investigate because he had to go off shift. And this ended up being the area where Thomas's car was later found. Now this hasn't been 100% verified but I will say that when I was a cop wild horses wouldn't have stopped me from checking that gate. And you don't have to go off shift. I mean, you rarely finish on time anyway. There was many nights when I was in the police and I would be devastated when a job would come in just when I was about to go home. And I'd have a little groan about it, but then you just carry on. Because as a cop, if you don't have that built-in sense of curiosity and duty to check out an important lead, then you're in the wrong job. And it pains me to complain about a fellow officer. Anyone who watches this channel knows that I am hugely loyal to anyone serving in the emergency services because I know what a tough job it can be. But from the very beginning while I was looking into this case, I sensed that there was something up. So the community search for Thomas, driving horseback, uh, riding across the prairie, going on foot and by truck. And at 8.40 a.m., Thomas's friend Christian persuaded her dad to go up in their family helicopter to search for her friend. They found his car just four miles from Thomas's home. Christian said it was a strange place to find the truck though, because she didn't even know that dirt road was there. And she said she was pretty sure Thomas didn't know about it either because they never drove up to that point. And Thomas's mom also said that it was never somewhere her son would have gone. Thomas's phone, laptop, backpack, and keys were all missing from the car, although the charges were still there and there was no sign of Thomas. The last location of Thomas's phone was later pinged to Wildcat Stadium in Canadian at 12.13 p.m. Bloodhounds tracked his scent to the Canadian River about a mile east of where his car was found. And Thomas's truck was very briefly searched and none of his personal belongings were found. But officers did discover a smudge of blood located inside the car, along with an empty 25 caliber bullet casing and a debit card belonging to his friend, Michael. Now, someone had urinated on the ground outside the car, but that area wasn't cordoned off and no samples were taken. Hemphill County Sheriff's Chief Deputy Brent Clapp later said that there was no sign of a conflict or assault or abduction. There was nothing, nothing to suggest any of that. But there was evidence of blood and a shell casing from a bullet. I mean, wasn't that enough? Thomas's truck was returned to Penny the same day it was found. No forensic testing was undertaken, uh, but the bullet casing and the blood had been removed. And in the weeks following Thomas's disappearance, the water treatment plant where his truck was found was drained. The nearby 63 acre Lake Marvin was surveyed with sonar equipment. The Canadian River was searched um, into Oklahoma all the way and there was no sign of Thomas. So how could this popular young man just disappear into thin air? Well, Penny said that Sheriff Nathan Lewis asked for Thomas's phone passcode, even though his phone hadn't been recovered. Now, Penny and Sheriff Lewis had history because in 2015, Penny made a complaint against him about an incident that occurred in June that year. Now, Lewis wasn't with Hemphill County Sheriff Office at that time, but he did stop Tom and his friends and was quite as you say in England, arsy with them, maybe a bit aggressive with them, while they were out walking and he made Tom get into his car with him to tell him off. And it's claimed that Lewis was unprofessional and swore at Tom. And according to the report I read, he failed to notify Hemphill County Sheriff Office of his actions and was later reprimanded. Between half one in the morning until 6 a.m. Uh, the day following Thomas's disappearance, a truck matching the description of his truck was seen on CCTV driving around various locations in Canadian. His car was seen driving onto the wastewater area up a small hill and parked under some trees from an isolated spot about 500 yards uh, from the Oasis Cove Apartments complex and this is where it was found. Penny was interviewed by police and asked if it was possible for Thomas to have killed himself. 
Now, with no other explanation for his disappearance at the time, she said, well, it was possible. He'd recently broken up with his girlfriend and he'd had a lot on at school. And she said with that much pressure, it wasn't out of the realms of any high school kids to commit suicide. When she was talking from experience, it must have played on the back of her mind because her dad, suffering from depression, shot himself to death in 1998. But while she said it was possible, she also said she didn't believe that was the case. So what about his ex-girlfriend? Was it connected to their breakup? An online Facebook community called Moms for Tom was created to raise awareness of Tom's case. Two months after he disappeared, a North Plains electrical worker spotted a backpack and it was next to a barbed wire fence on Lake Marvin Road. Now this was about four miles from where um, search dogs lost trace of Thomas's scent during their early searches in November. Thomas's brother Tucker believed it was put there afterwards as that area had been searched for days with no trace. Sheriff Lewis said it had been there a while. It had an indentation in the ground where the backpack was sitting, he said. It was wet inside and out. Pages were almost mouldy at that point and we didn't find his cell phone. Thomas's school issued laptop uh, computer was still inside but hadn't been used. And because of the bag's condition, it didn't provide any clues. And a set of footprints were found nearby. Now, Penny wasn't told about any of this discovery by the sheriff's office until five days after it was found. And frustrated by how slowly the investigation was moving, she hired a private investigator, Philip Klein, um, who's a very famous high profile missing person investigator. He solved lots of cases and his services don't come cheap. In October 2017, Klein carried out a search around Lake Marvin Road, near where Tom's backpack was found, and a gun holster was discovered. They also discovered a mobile phone, and the woman who found the phone took a photo of it and later told Penny that it was rose gold. But Penny said that Thomas's phone wasn't rose gold, it was just gold. However, um, officers did say that that was Thomas's phone. So according to the Hemphill County Sheriff, the phone is Thomas's and it's still being held at the crime lab. But Penny doesn't believe this. And people have questioned as to why Nathan Lewis asked for Tom's phone passcode long before the phone was found. Klein, Penny's private detective, uh, wasn't getting a lot of joy from local law enforcement with regards to Thomas's case. In fact, he said that Sheriff Lewis had gone out of his way to be unhelpful. Klein asked if their cadaver dog could have a sniff of Thomas's backpack for any scent of human remains and he was told no. So on January 26, 2018, uh, Sheriff Nathan Lewis put in a formal request to the Texas Attorney General's office asking if they would take over the official investigation into Thomas's disappearance due to an online petition made by Penny. Now, Thomas's mother requested this through the petition and she had loads of signatures and supporters and several parties were asked to take a lie detector test as the officers took over the case. Now, I have to point, point out that lie detectors aren't 100% reliable, which is why we don't tend to use them in the UK. Sheriff Lewis took the test though and he said later apparently that he was anxious when the examiner asked if he was involved with the disappearance of Thomas Brown when interviewed as he said well yeah I am involved in his disappearance I'm wrapped up in this damn case but my answer had to be no because I wasn't involved in the way they were asking for the question. Lewis also said that as he feared the response to the question came up as him having told a lie. And on January the 9th, 2019, human remains were discovered in an area near Lake Marvin Road. Thomas's remains were actually found by Pine Gregory, the Hemp Hill uh, deputy who drove around with Tucker on the night he disappeared. And according to the Unfound podcast group, Gregory found the remains while he was searching for deer antlers um, while on shift. It was a really isolated spot, far away from where anyone would expect him to be while on duty, so it all seemed very odd. According to Thomas's mum, Sheriff Lewis denied volunteers and private investigators access to search the area where Thomas's remains were found. Following forensic and dental records testing, on January the 16th, the remains were identified as belonging to Thomas. Now, I need to talk about the narrative that was being pushed by certain officers from the beginning of this case. 
First, the officer suggested to the family that Thomas had taken his own life. Then they said he'd run away and later tried to make out that he was gay and perhaps he'd run away with an older man. But they didn't seem to take into consideration the blood and the gun casing being found in the car, let alone the amount of blood later revealed by private investigators through luminol testing. Also, the recovery of Thomas's car and personal items just didn't make any sense with where things were and the timings and him having meant to have killed himself. Nothing made any sense. 10 days after Thomas went missing, it said that Penny was shown a photo of her son, Thomas, of him getting fuel on the night he disappeared. And she was asked to confirm if it was him and she said, yes, it was. And she stated later that she always thought the photo was, looked like it was taken by a person. It was so close up, you know, not like dash cam or CCTV. But when asked about it later on, Sheriff Lewis completely denied that this photo ever existed. Do you remember the debit card belonging to Michael, Thomas's friend, which is found in Thomas's truck? Well, things took a twist on January the 21st, 2019, just days after uh, Thomas's remains were discovered. Jeff, Michael's father, committed suicide by shooting himself. Jeff's suicide was reported to the media by the sheriff's office before the medical examiner released their findings. Now this caused all sorts of hullabaloo in the community, as a lot of people wondered if his sudden death was related to Thomas's disappearance and death. A suicide note was found, and although its contents haven't been revealed, I did read online though that Jeff had suffered from severe depression all of his life and that he had been unwell. Now, take that with a pinch of salt, all of this I have read online, I can't 100% verify it. So to me though, while the timing seems odd, there's no firm evidence to say that it was related to Thomas's death. And to be fair, you know, I've lost debit cards which have slipped out of my pocket into the foothold of my car in the past. So again, it's not beyond the realms of imagination that Michael could have just, he could have just lost his card after they'd been out that night. Anyway, it's alleged that Pine Gregory, the officer who found Thomas's remains, was fired from the Hemp Hill County Sheriff's Office in May 2019. Apparently, he has a documented criminal past with regards to an incident in 2003 when he pointed a gun at a Pizza Hut delivery driver and told them to get out of their car because he apparently thought they were acting suspiciously when really all they were doing was delivering pizza. He was off duty at the time and a complaint was made. Well, him being fired in 2019 had nothing to do with that and apparently had nothing to do with Thomas's case. Despite all of this though, investigators accused Thomas's mom, Penny, of hiding her son's body because she was ashamed that he'd committed suicide. But thankfully, the members of the Facebook group, Moms for Tom, got behind Penny and put up billboards all around Canadian. The billboards were vandalized though, not long afterwards with the phrase, there is a killer amongst us being cut out. In November 2019, Klein Investigations, you know, the private investigators, um, released an update to say they were treating the case as a homicide and would continue to investigate. Nathan Lewis then resigned from his post as Hemphill County Sheriff after an investigation looking into him submitting falsified training records for his team. So here's my take on things. Someone in Canadian is lying, and that is plainly obvious. This has been investigated by many different departments, and to be honest, I don't think it's feasible that every single officer involved is covering this up. It just can't be done. But it's not beyond the realms of comprehension that someone close to the investigation had been lying from the outset. But I don't believe for a second that Thomas's family are involved in this. As a mom, I think the question of Penny covering up her son's alleged suicide because she was embarrassed is just nothing short of ridiculous. The fact that she had to hire a very expensive private investigator to find the evidence which was passed over just makes me angry. And because this poor family deserved better than this, if blood is cleaned up from a crime scene, it can still be seen under a luminol lamp. So if Thomas killed himself, then who cleaned it up? because it wasn't visible to the naked eye. Why didn't the um, police department agree to their cadaver dog having access to Thomas's backpack if that was the case? 
And was it because it didn't suit with the narrative being pushed? After all, a dead person can't very well throw their own personal belongings around. And as Thomas's mother said, how on earth would she have the strength to move her son's body? And why would she want to? So they're saying she'd rather just dispose of her son's body uh, in a shallow grave rather than give him a decent burial because she's embarrassed after everything she's done to try and find answers in this case. That poor woman has been through hell and honestly, I shouldn't get so emotionally involved. But cases like this really get to me. And I don't know how anyone could accuse her family of such a thing. And maybe I'm reading too much into it. And by putting such a thing to Penny, it was just the officers simply investigating every single road, um, dotting those I's and crossing every T. And that may well be the case. We have to remember that we only get a tiny side of the story when it comes to the actual investigation, but we get a whole world of speculation online by people who didn't know the victim at all. And I don't want to be one of these people, which is why I'm presenting what I've found for you to make your own mind up. And I do hope that we find answers and Penny and her family can put Thomas to rest. And I just want to remind you folks of my disclaimer, which is in the box below. Uh, I only have access to information that I find online. I don't have access to police reports or anything like this. And I am just surmising. This is just an opinion. And you know, nobody has been charged with any murders or any offenses with regards to Thomas's uh, disappearance and subsequent death. Have you heard of this case? Because I'd love to hear your thoughts. And it was a challenge trying to sort through all the information online. And if I have said something inaccurate, please let me know in the comments below. If you're interested in unsolved mysteries, I do recommend you check out my recent video of some teenage who stumbled upon a body in a suitcase while playing an app. But thanks a million for tuning in guys. And remember, incidents like these are extremely rare. So don't lose sleep. Until next time. Bye-bye.